Hello and welcome to Cast Adrift, a behind-the-scenes podcast for the Sojourn audio drama. In this show, we're going to be having discussions with cast and crew and answer your questions about the show. Every episode of Cast Adrift is available for free on YouTube, so be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you want to listen to the full audio drama, there are links in the description to all of the retailers. Now, for exciting news, this November 14th, this Saturday, November 14th, we're having a live listening party of episode one, The Cold Divide. This is at 12 p.m. PST or 8 p.m. GMT. And if you'd like to listen in with the rest of us, join our Discord server, which is linked in the description. I'm Larissa, the associate producer and the voice of Captain Cassandra Farron. And today we're talking with show creator Daniel Orrit and the show's composer, Samuel Redfern. We're going to be discussing his approach to the music of the show and how he uses it to support the themes and characters of the show. And just so you know, spoilers for Volume 1, so if you haven't listened, please go ahead and listen. You can also listen to the entire soundtrack for free on Spotify, YouTube Music, and several other distributors, which we'll also link down below. So, hi guys! Hello! Hey folks! Hey! How's everybody doing today? I'm doing pretty well. I, I mean, I, I just about made it to this after my shower broke and I fixed it and then various <laughs> other things happened. But I'm, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Sounds like I'm doing better than Dan anyway. <laughs> uh, quick question for, for you, Sam. Where Whereabouts are you based? Are you in the UK? Yes, I'm in the UK, I'm based in Wrexham, which is where uh, Dan uh, was based uh, for a long time before he moved to to Canada. So, um, yeah, so that's where I'm based. Yeah. So how did, how did you two end up working together? What was that journey? We have, we have a, a I was mutual a mutual friend. I was, you, Sam, yeah. Sam was recommended to me by a mutual friend. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I reached out to you to, through email denied them and, um, yeah. And then that's, that's how things, uh, sort of got started. Um, I'm not going to lie. Like we, we had the, uh, the whole complicated process of recruitment for all of these important roles. And then like Sam, it was like a friend of mine suggests this person in the pub. And I'm like, okay, whatever. We'll, we'll see what that sounds like. You know, <laughs> assuming that it's like <laughs> something we'd check before we began the actual process of looking for someone. And yeah. then I get sent this track that sounds like it's straight out of Mass Effect or something. <laughs> like, oh my <laughs> God. Okay. <laughs> like, we guess we don't need to look for a composer anymore. So <laughs> that worked out. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So was this just like a little spec thing? Yeah, it, it was like a like a concept thing. Like it was pretty much what Dan said. Really, I was in the the pub, um, and we were talking, and, and that was when I was very first told about the sojourn. And so I thought, oh, cool, I'll, I'll reach out, you know. And um, and and yeah, I came up with the the concept, and Dan sent me like a an email, just kind of um, explaining the the concept of the show and. The, the main character and things like that. And, and I uh, sent a, um, a concept back to him of, of an idea, um, which he, which he thought was, that uh, worked. So, um, yeah. And that really got the ball rolling from there, I think. Yeah. I mean, what is now Cassandra's theme is pretty much exactly that, what you sent yeah. me, right? Like this, yeah, this yeah. Yeah, it's ex- we went straight to this level of quality from a pub in Wrexham. So that's, <laughs> that's what happened there. <laughs> that's, Indeed. that's amazing. That's incredible. Um, so when you were working on this little spec piece, what, what inspirations were you drawing from? So, uh, Dan's initial email had the, um, the treasure planet soundtrack in there. And I really felt that he was trying to get this, um, this like lost at sea kind of idea across. Um, and he also, you know, gave details about, um, Cass's backstory and where we find her at, at the start of the sojourn. Um, and I, and I thought the Treasure Planet soundtrack was a really good reference for that. So that's, that's kind of the thing, um, that I was going along with, with there. As, as I explained to Sam, when we started out, I've always wanted to capture a kind of, uh, a sort of nautical romanticism feel for, uh, for the Sojourn. I've often said that the, um, the final scene of Master and Commander with the duet as they're sailing off into the sunset is the feel that I want the whole so- Sojourn to have, basically. With the Boccherini solo and all that, or the duet, and uh, and that's that's kind of like the reference frame for everything. And I think Sam, you did a really good job of uh, of interpreting what I wanted there and 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 bring bring it to life. It was a good email. It was very it was very well detailed, and you you knew exactly 
the the vision that you wanted. Yeah, the the nautical idiom, um, the idea that it's a like a British colonial allegory. That was that was very clear. Cass's theme is a waltz. Why pick a waltz theme? That's not something that you typically hear in like soundtracks. I can't actually think of any examples of waltz. Yeah, um, that's that's to do with. So the the six eight rhythm the dun 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 dun, dun that, that that's to do with um, again like sound symbolism the idea of like waves um, you know that Dan was talking about the the, the nautical idiom um, and so we wanted to kind of evoke um, you know the, this subtle idea of being out on the water with the waves and kind of thing and this kind of like. Yeah, the, the six eight rhythm is very idiomatic of that kind of motion, you know. So, I guess that's why. That is so cool. I've got to say, Sam, the uh, like obviously there's a lot we can't talk about in terms of uh, character arcs and things, but like I've always found that you are very enthusiastic about completely understanding the emotionality behind the music you create, and like we've had a lot of conversations where you've we've you've like been really seeking to completely understand the totality of the, of the feeling behind these things. Yeah. And it, that's really encouraging because the results are so apparent. And like this, I feel like every, every sort of emotional part of this show that needs a sound in, in the music has that sound. Like it really is captured really well. And I think the audience appreciates that too. Yeah. Um, so as far as I understand it, um, you weren't really given any context for Meds's theme. It was just kind of, Here's what we know. Here's who she is in the story. Go for it. Is that correct? Pretty, yeah, pretty much. And, and Meds's theme, um, again, very much sticking with the folk idiom. Uh, her theme in episode three comes at a point of um, introspection. Um, she strikes me as someone who has seen much uh, betrayal in her life in terms of committing herself to a faction and then becoming disillusioned with what that faction stands for. And we find her now more as an unmovable individualist with plenty of armor up to protect a vulnerable core. So I really wanted to show her as grounded, you know, this is not establishment kind of music. It's very folk inspired, um, but it also has, um, it also has a soft introspective emotional core um, that she has to protect, you know, so I, that, that was kind of the idea that I was trying to get across there, yeah. Okay. So what, like, tangible musical tricks did you use to to convey that idea? I mean, this is getting into, yeah, like, yeah, like sound, sound symbolism. And, you know, one concept, for example, is the idea of shape language, you know, the idea of that more more edge shapes like squares and triangles are synonymous with rigidity, order, conservatism, and borders. More rounded shapes like a circle is far more movable, so it's associated with fluidity, freedom, liberation. And the same applies for music and and sound. You know, synthesizers have at their fundamentals uh, sine waves, square waves, and uh, triangle waves. And the the actual sound of a rhythmic figure or melodic figure can give you clues as to what philosophy is being referred to. Um, if I asked, you know, there are two characters, Booba and Kiki, when you imagine what those characters might sound like, what, what those characters might look like, hopefully you imagine Booba as a pretty rounded looking person, maybe a big belly or a round face. And Kiki, on the other hand, has a this narrow pointy chin and this tall, thin person with short hair. So how rounded or spiky their name sounded to you gave you clues about what to expect. You know, when meeting, for example, Darth Vader for the first time, well, nobody knows what a Darth Vader is. So design heuristics have to be used to tell the audience in the first few seconds of him walking on screen. In the music, you have um, stacked minor triads played on brass in a spiked uh, staccato rhythm. Well, the thing about brass instruments is if you were to design one on a synthesizer, you would use triangle wave as a starting point. And then in the, in the design of Darth Vader, he's basically this big triangle with triangles and edges in his mask. And it's because the philosophy of Darth Vader's authoritarian order. But something I should mention as well is um, anti-establishment can also be synonymous with brass and edge sounds because it's a force that challenges the status quo. You know, think about punk rock, very spiky kind of sound. So if you think about Indiana Jones's theme, um, is also played on brass, even though he is the antithesis of Darth Vader. You know, same with the, the rebel theme, I guess, which brings us to the, the next concept of 
uh, melody, harmony, and dissonance. You know, for order, the use of more stepwise notes seems to be synonymous with order. And for freedom, chaos, the use of more leaping melody seems to work there, which is what, you know, Indiana Jones's theme is like. Something else that's going on is rhythm where the Imperial March is this pretty static rhythm. Indiana Jones' theme is more bouncy and actually makes use of sound symbolism. His rhythm sounds like a horse galloping. It features a galloping idiom, which suggests the idea of adventure and freedom. So when it comes to the sojourn, with the understanding of um, what Cass is like, where she is going, you know, I'm looking to create a melody that is pretty stepwise and features a static rhythm. But the, the, B, the B theme is then where she is going, that all of a sudden becomes more open, rhythmically involved and leaping as if to suggest the liberation from order component. And, and likewise with um, Meta's theme, that's way more, um, yeah, you know, like I said, like introspective, you know, solo violin, um, you know, as if to suggest that uh, emotional center. It, like I said, it's quite a, an intuitive process, but yeah, I guess those are the kinds of things that you might think about when, when coming up with, with these character themes, yeah. Okay. I, I love the melding of the hyper-technical definition that you just explained, and just, like, it boils down to, and then I just felt it. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> I love, the, I love the summary that Darth Vader is a big triangle covered in triangles that sounds like a triangle. It's like, <laughs> that's great. I feel like there's a missed opportunity for the composer to just like throw in a little, like John Williams just put in a little bit of triangle <laughs> <laughs> actual instrument in the Darth Vader that's theme. True. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I, I mean, a lot of a lot of it as well is um, earworms. Um, when I'm just doing not, you know, when I'm not actually at my um, at my desk, um, when I'm when I'm doing, you know, something else, basically, you know, there's always uh, music that might be going on, you know, it, um, in my, you know, have you ever had like a, a tune stuck in your head, like a, like an earworm? It, it's things like that, you know, and I, I'll make a note of those, and um, over time, you know, I'll build up um like a like a music diary almost so there's a lot of lot of ideas in there as well i i can go through that um and certain things will stand out to me um with in terms of what i'm looking for and and sometimes sometimes i come up with things completely fresh like i think cass's theme was completely fresh um and elizabeth's theme was born out of cass's theme i think meds's theme was actually something that i'd previously thought of and i and i heard in my music diary and I thought, yeah, that's, that will work for what I'm looking for. You know, with regards to the, um, the concepts I, I was mentioned earlier, you know, Darth Vader being a big triangle, that's <laughs> so like a triangle, um, things like that. Yeah. As, as I recall, uh, Fair Winds, our credits music was something that you just made. Like it wasn't made for Sojourn. It was just something you had that we, uh, that we then adapted. And that's like, I think maybe one of the most well-received tracks we've got on, on the soundtrack. Like people seem to love that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was, yeah, again, um, like an earworm kind of um, situation. I don't, I couldn't, I, I don't, I'm not sure what I was doing, um, but, um, you know, it, it would have just come to me. And then I, I don't know whether I might have sung it into my phone, you know, the, the voice memo kind of thing, or, or I might have gone over to my piano and, and recorded it there. Um, I, and it, it just kind of, yeah, sits there. And then when I go through for ideas for, for the sojourn, you know, these kind of things, yeah, they kind of pop out, you know. Um, and and the, the fair winds uh, tune was one of those. I think I was. I think I originally imagined it as like a, like more of a pop song, like a like a like you know like Jonas Blue or um, you know something I've just heard in in, in the charts. And that's probably how I initially imagined it because you get all sorts of folk melodies coming into into the charts as well. You know that's probably why it has such an earworm uh, melodic kind of uh, you know catchiness to it. You know. Uh, but then it's just it, then it just got reimagined as as something more direct for for the sojourn, but still keeping that kind of pop music roots. Yeah, if you if you, if you were to think about the the tune, um, you could probably you could probably make it into like um into a dance track. You know, if you were to change if it not being performed on a on a violin anymore, maybe if it was moved over to a synthesizer and then you used to change all the instrumentation underneath that you know, all of a sudden you'd have something that's more like a dance track or something that would be in, 
you know, more more, um, more of a pop kind of thing. You realize what you've just done now. You have now committed yourself to making a dance remix of Fairwinds. <laughs> That's what could happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure lots of people would dig it. Yeah. Sojourn dance party. <laughs> okay, well, your little lecture there about triangles and, and shapes and how that relates to music obviously demonstrates an awful lot of, of technical skill and knowledge. So was there any additional research that you had to do for the show, or was this just all off of previous experience and skills that you'd picked up? Um, yeah, a lot of it is to do with experience and the kind of knowledge um, and understanding that I've um, picked up over over time. Um, but with every, with every project that I do, you know, th there are certain steps that are pretty consistent in terms of, you know, the preparation that I do. Um, one would be character understanding the characters, um, looking at the, the scripts, you know, talking with, with Dan about what the kind of things that he has in mind, you know, and what I'm looking for specifically is understanding the nature of their behavioral pattern and how the journey that they embark upon impacts that behavioral pattern. And, and what I mean by behavioral pattern, um, I think a good way to think about it is if you think of a film like the, the matrix, the matrix world, is everything that we've ever known and there's no reason to suspect to suspect there is anything else you know that's what a behavioral pattern is like you know but one, one day something will happen which shows you there is another side something that you're missing something you've perhaps always suspected that existed but it's been buried deep and down inside of you and needs to be rediscovered so a character like cassandra farron you know her matrix her behavioral pattern is one of order um as people will discover in the story um, what her background is like, it will become clear that she's never really known anything else. But then one day she meets Elizabeth, who represents the other side, uh, liberation, uh, freedom, and leaving the walls of the establishment and going out into the into a world of unknown possibilities. So it, I think, yeah, it's 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 important to get an understanding of yeah the philosophy of what these characters are representing, you know, the archetypes and so on, um, and how that pans out across the, the entirety of the story. I, I, yeah, I would say that was kind of like a big part of the, the research or preparation that I do. Did you do any research in terms of instrumentation or specific uh, musical styles or, or genres? Was there anything that you had to play with that you'd never played with before? Sure. Um, a lot of referencing um, went on. Apart, you know, the, the Treasure Planet soundtrack was a, a starting point. Um, but then we had all, all these kind of philosophies coming out where, where I just kind of extrapolated more and more and more. Um, so like folk, folk music is a big part of it. But then also there's the more traditionalist, um, you know, orchestral kind of sounds like, you know, your Holst and, um, you know, Stravinsky, Ravel, uh, Vaughan Williams, you know, these kind of composers that will be uh, more appropriate to the, the, the homey, nature of say the the being on the um the avalon or or that kind of thing but then but then also when cast steps out more into unknown kind of territory then the 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 style of music gets a bit more um a bit more alienating you know so uh, composers like you know minimalists like john adams uh, in episode two uh hilda giona de turf you know the the composer who did the joker and chernobyl soundtrack she she was a reference there Ainon Zer, you know, the, the guy who did Fallout. Hans Zimmer, the, the Interstellar soundtrack was a big one. Yeah, they, they all have these kind of like facets of philosophies, which that which I reference, you know, and, and pull together a series of references. And Dan has on Spotify his own mood board, and, and I have mine as well. Um, and we kind of like swap notes on that as well. So let's talk about the aliens. They've got a really interesting kind of instrumentation. What's that story? Um, yeah, so it would have been, yeah, Gab suggested uh, Symbolon and Dulcima, and Dan was very keen on like a medieval or ethnic choir kind of idea. Um, I think that the, the general idea being that the, uh, the aliens um, they're an ancient religious spiritual kind of civilization, you know. So, so drone scapes with voices and ethnic instruments and it evokes a Zen, 
uh, spiritual kind of idea. So that was another side of references as well. And, you know, the kind of soundtracks I went into with that one was um, Hans Zimmer's uh, Gladiator soundtrack, you know, the, the stuff that he did with uh, Lisa Gerrard, um, that, kind of, that kind of thing was quite key there. Well, obviously, we wanted that kind of like sense of uh, impenetrable mystery, especially for early on in the story where you definitely want uh, CDC 41 Gamma to feel like a kind of forbidding and unknowable place because you've really got to capture that sense of mystery at the start of a story like this. I think um, as sometimes it's been done right and sometimes it's been done wrong. I think maybe more often it's been done wrong in terms of uh, this kind of exploration feel, not just with soundtrack, but in general. Like, for instance... Uh, Mass Effect Andromeda and Star Trek Voyager are both shows about being completely alone in the in the complete unknown. But in both cases, they manage to lose that sense of mystery after about forty five minutes. Like the uh, they they don't really get to keep that going. And I think dragging out the uh, the sense of of what you do not know, like the uh, absence of understanding, to keep people engaged early on in an exploration story is important. And a lot of that comes from music especially representing the aliens in this case, because they are the most unknowable factor for the audience thus far. Yeah, mysterious. What was it like working with reimagining and playing around with a pre-existing song? Because Wilderness, the show's main theme, is not actually composed or written by you. It's written by Taylor Davis. What was it like playing with somebody else's piece and, and trying to work that into your own imagining for what the show soundtrack would sound like yeah um well wilderness um is that was an, another really good reference because um the idea that taylor davis is trying to get across there you know that the even the track title wilderness you know talking about the um about treasure planet you know the thing that they have in common is um you know this kind of like yeah going out into the unknown um, you know, liberation from order, um, these kind of ideas. Um, so that, that I, just as an, as a, a reference, it was important from that point of view, uh, actually getting into the, um, the material itself to be reimagined for the sojourn. Um, it was, it was, it's a really, it's a really good tune. Um, Gab came up with uh, an idea to, um, try out different, different chords, uh, sequence, um, which, which I like the idea a lot. And we gave that a go, and um, and, and and yeah, it was just a, kind of a case of just um, taking the um, those that chord sequence, imagining the kind of rhythmic figures. You know, I was looking at um, going on along the lines of the the, the um, British colonial allegory again, Master of the Waves, um, kind of like rock kind of sound, very confident um, kind of sound, very rigid kind of rhythmic figures, and then and then put in Taylor Davis's tune. Uh, on top of that. So we posted on our Discord server asking for questions for Sam from you, the fans. And people have given us a lot of really good questions. We've narrowed it down to our top three, but maybe we'll we'll do another round with Sam where you can ask even more questions of him. But we'll see. But let's let's go with the with the top three that we've picked here. Izzy, the Wiki Witch of the West, asks, out of all of the characters of the show, who is your favorite to compose music for? Um, I think probably, um, probably Cass, you know, that was the first idea that I came up with. Um, and it was so much about pinning down the style of the show and also the idi idiosyncrasies of her story, um, where we initially find her, where is she going, that kind of thing. And so that was from, and from there that, you know, that was such an important starting point, uh, from there that we could really expand on the, on the style, you know, Elizabeth's idea was, was really born out of that and, you know, and that, and that led to a thing and that led to a thing, you know, so yeah, I, I guess Cass is probably my favorite. Yeah. Atomic Sub asks, which piece of the soundtrack are you most proud of? The, the main themes for the characters are really comprehensive and they're turning out to be malleable as well. So the themes for Cass, Elizabeth, Meds, the various ideas for Valandra to show the different aspects of her character. Uh, Vedric's theme, I think, has a lot of promise later on. So I think that's a component that's gone well. Tantalus was the first piece that I showed to everyone in the production for the first episode, and that was uh, a nice indication that we were going in the right direction. 
Um, I really like uh, A Life Not Lived. That was a style of orchestration that I had not really tried before. Um, it's made entirely of semi-quavers, and the idea is that it all homogenizes to, together to give an abstract impression of melody and harmony, um, you know, like an ambient kind of thing. And that was largely informed by the idea of order versus chaos, where um, lyrical, homey kind of ideas are contrasted with more chaotic approaches, like, you know, like having every instrument in the orchestra play semi-quavers all at once. Now, which which scene did that track play over? Oh, oh, it's the gas giant. It's it's when they see the, the gas, gas giant, giant, right? That's what, yeah, yeah. And the idea is that Elizabeth is showing Cass, you know, a, a life that she's not really had, you know, there's, you know, there's more to life than, you know, what's, what, what her background has been about, you know. It's this perspective change. It's, it's, it's Elizabeth kind of opening the window on her very optimistic, very yeah. kind of uh, energetic, extroverted life view, as she says. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, you yeah. know, if you if you look, look away from the focus of this task and this task for a second and just look at how amazing life is, basically, which is it's the first kind of cracking open of that uh, of that uh, line of thought for Cass. Yeah, and, and that's it's exactly it. Yeah, and Elizabeth is, um, you know, her mind is just so full of, abstract possibilities imagining what is out there that's what her fixation is about so you know her sound is very extroverted um but in c- contrast to, to Cass which is a much more conservative kind of philosophy you know her her, her philosophy is a lot more about like do we have the data do we have the procedure and and Elizabeth is, is just like just, just put that to one side a second and just appreciate you know th- th- there's more to life than that you know stop and smell the roses yeah yeah can I say, uh, I think my favorite, if you discount like the big hard hitting, super great ones like, uh, Fair Winds and Cassandra's theme, the, uh, my favorite like piece of incidental music is the, uh, the storm from episode two. Cause that's like, I think you just really nailed down the kind of frenetic kind of feel of that. It's very, it's very tense and kind of building tension really well. It's, it's just, and it's got a great opening few bars. It's good stuff. That was a very similar approach to A Life Not Lived. Um, the, the storm, again, was like a, the opening piano thing kind of reminded me of um, Tubular Bells, if you know that, you know, the, the Exorcist, if you've ever seen that film. Uh, Tubular Bells in that one, that kind of like minimalist figure that just plays over and over and over again. It was kind of like, it's very kind of like, um, yeah, like alienating, yeah, and spooky. It definitely, uh, it definitely worked to like, increase the tempo of everything as the uh, uh meteoroids were coming in because obviously we're, we're an audio drama you've we've really got to lean on this kind of thing you can't like uh visually communicate when something abstract like that is getting increasingly deadly and uh that that I've really really contributed to it as well as of course Kennedy's amazing sound effects and and that's where the you know the semi quavers kind of idea all those notes happening all at once really gave the impression of of chaos you can really um see all the 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 meteorites you know it, it, like i said it's like it's like a storm you know it's it's a very chaotic situation with lots of things flying in the air and stuff you know so you need lots of rhythmic kind of figures to get that imagery across yeah yeah it was definitely definitely brought my adrenaline up and that's exactly the point um the arc smith asks is there any piece of the original soundtrack that you feel even now may have required a bit more work? This is not to say your work isn't good, but do you feel any particular piece of the track still had room for improvement? Um, there's there's always room for improvement with every soundtrack I do because I've learned so much in the process of doing them. So um, something that has changed since I started is that, you know, my folder of ideas that I mentioned before, for the, for the Sojourn that has gone from about, a hundred when I very first started to maybe over 500 now. Oh so there's God. a lot more choice. <laughs> there's, there's a lot more choice. There's a lot more choice there. And, and, you know, that's just happened as a, as a consequence of discovering the material more and more. Um, I guess from, from a production standpoint, um, something that is different between episode one and the other episodes is newer software, um, which has given a lot more choice and freedom. So, you know, maybe that might have made an impact. But, by and large, you're pretty happy with what you've come up with so far. It's not bad. It's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. I've got to say, I, I, th- I think I should. Uh, I think I should take this chance to say that I really do think that your soundtrack is like a, a big part of why people are loving this series. Like, I think we've 
Like it's it's a huge part of the identity of the show, and it's it's definitely like just one of the things that has that has made this work. And it was it, it always whenever we get an episode to the point where it gets the music put into it, that's always when I'm most excited to be listening back to the scenes because it just gets injected with all this life, and it's this kind of Frankenstein moment where they throw the lever, you know? Yeah, and it's it's just great stuff. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much for for sharing all of that with us, Sam. That's so incredibly fascinating. I love hearing. It really is, yeah. Hearing how like what you're talking about, like sonic shapes and and all of these different technical ideas, and how that incorporates with these far more abstract, like emotional kind of movements. It's it's such an interesting dynamic to explore. Heh, <laughs> dynamic. Music nerds would get that pun. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so thank thank you for for sharing all of that with us again this has been so cool pleasure pleasure this has been cast adrift a behind the scenes podcast for the sojourn audio drama which features discussions with cast and crew and answers your questions once again we'd like to thank sam redfern for chatting with us today and giving us such an incredibly detailed look at the music of the sojourn now, just a reminder, we have a live listening party scheduled for November 14th at 12 p.m. PST, 8 p.m. GMT. So if you want to join in on our listening party, please visit the link in the description and join our Discord server. And then you'll also get announcements for future Cast Drift episodes. You can ask questions about the show and just meet and mingle with other fans of the show. You can also follow us on Twitter for further updates. And then obviously subscribe and click the bell to be notified for this YouTube channel for when we publish more episodes of Cast Adrift. But until next time, thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you on the next one. Fair winds.